Hey, Ken. It's Ryan. I listened to the Date Night Dice podcast recently and just heard that you maybe you'd be interested in playing Maria with me and Ben. I would love for you to play, but I also know that you were looking for a rules video that kind of doesn't take a long time. There isn't one out there, so I'm going to make one right now for you so you can play with us because I would love for you to play. I think it'd be a great game for the three of us to kind of play maybe a lot and get used to so we can really have a lot of fun with it. So this is going to be Maria as much as a, an abbreviated teach as I can do. Um, to hopefully not bore you to freaking death. So without further ado, let's get into it right now. So here's how this game goes, okay? This is Maria, a game of the war of the Austrian succession. So thematically, really quickly, uh, Maria Theresa is the daughter of the emperor of Austria. He is about to die, and he says, hey, everybody, I want you to welcome my daughter as the new empress of Russia, and acknowledge her and they're all like yeah for sure sounds great everything's awesome then the king dies and they're like no nah, let's fucking go to war so prussia starts a battle to basically end that peace armistice or whatever is going on okay so now everyone's battling and trying to uh take over austria to be the holy roman emperor or whatever so that's the basic setup of the theme. So the way this plays out is you have three players playing this game. You can play with two, but really you want to play with three to get the full experience. One player is going to play the Austrian player, which exists in these white areas of the map. Okay. And they are only playing Austria. Another player plays France, who is in this red area over here and this orange Bavaria army over here. So they control France and their minor cooperating power, Bavaria. OK, and then the third player is the Prussian player, and they are in this blue area here. They control Prussia. They have a minor cooperating power as well of Saxony, but Saxony can potentially defect and come to Austria, which I'll get over. I'll go over in a minute, but they control these two armies and they also control this third, uh, this fourth, I should say, major power, the pragmatic army, which is made up of the Netherlands and the British. Now, the crazy thing is you can see this board is kind of bifurcated into two right here on this which is called the bohemia map prussia and F prussia saxony france and bavaria these four are all allies against austria they are only attacking austria on this map that's not to say they're teammates but they're allies against austria they can only kill and hurt austria and get victory points in austria on this bohemia map okay on this littler map here which is called the flanders map the pragmatic army, who is, remember, also controlled by the Prussian player, is allied with Austria against France, so hostile to France. So these, the, the player who plays this Prussian guy um, is what the rulebook calls a schizophrenic player. So essentially, he is allied with France against Russia on the Bohemian map, but allied with Austria. I said Russia, but I meant Austria. He's allied with Austria against France on the Flanders map. And so it seems kind of confusing, but it all really works out. So the way you win a game of Maria is as a major power, all you have to do is run your victory point pool out of markers. Each of the four, there's three players, but each of the four major powers has a victory point pool. Now, the Prussian player controls Prussia's victory point pool and the Pragmatic Army's victory point pool, and they can win if either of these two run out. So they'll either win as the Pragmatic Army or they'll win as Prussia. Um, you don't have to empty both. The other powers only have to enter, empty their one pool, okay? So France controls France and Bavaria, but whenever France or Bavaria gets victory point markers, they are always victory point markers for France, okay? Austria only has the one they control, so they're only controlling Austria. Um, but if Prussia or Saxony at the beginning get victory point markers, it's only the Prussian pool that happens. These minor powers don't have their own victory point pools, okay? So that's the way to win, just getting your victory point markers onto the board. How do you get your victory point markers onto the board to win? Well, the best way to do that 
is to capture fortresses, which I'll go over in a minute. But when you capture a fortress, you simply just move through it with a general, and then that places one of your victory point markers uh, over that fortress, and you have gotten one step closer to winning the game. That simple. Another way to get victory point markers is simply to win a battle by three points of strength or more. That will also get you a battle victory point. Uh, which is one step closer to winning the game. It's that simple. You're just trying to get your victory point markers onto the board out of your pool. It's that simple, but it's not that easy because these are going to be going in flux. You know, they're going to be ebbing and flowing the whole time because fortresses are not necessarily going to remain captured the whole game. Uh, battle victory points are not necessarily going to remain the whole game. They can swing back and forth, and that's what takes the game uh, potentially from uh, three hours to six hours. Okay, so the game ends in one of two ways. Either one major power runs their entire pool out of victory points, like we just said, and the game ends immediately at the, at the end of that action phase and a win for that player. Or you can see the game is also split into these four years over here. And um, if we get to the end of the 12th round and nobody has run their pool out of victory points, there's a little mathematical equation we'll do, which I can explain while we're playing um, at the end of each year that we did decide to see who basically won that year. And then whoever has the lowest number of points at the end of the 12th year is considered to have won. Um, I've watched a couple of videos on this and there's one guy that I watched. He's played the game 20 plus times and it's never come down to a win lasting the whole game. Someone has always won by running the pool, their pool of victory points out. So that doesn't mean it's not possible, but it's, pro it's not probable that it will end that way. So likely the game will end when somebody runs their victory point pool out by capturing fortresses and having battles, okay? So that's the kind of the main high level overview. So now let's talk about how the game works. At the very beginning of the game, we're gonna go through the following five phases, okay? There's the politics phase, which I'm actually gonna talk about last. Uh, then there's the Hussars phase, which only applies to Austria. So if you're not playing Austria, you don't even have to worry about that. So I'm not going to even go over that in this explanation. It's a two-second thing um, that's just going to basically mess with the other players. But it's not even worth talking about. It's that simple. And then the meat of the game happens in these final three phases. France and Bavaria take their turn. Then Prussia and Saxony take their turn. Then Austria and the Pragmatic Army take their turn. And this is where the bulk of the game is in these three phases. Okay. So once we get to number three, France and Bavaria, we then look at the very next following thing down there, which says an action stage. So once the, once France and Bavaria activate, once that turn starts, they're going to do these following five steps. They're going to, number one, they're going to draw Oops, they're going to draw tactical cards. They're going to check supply. They're going to move. They're going to have combat, and they're going to have retroactive conquest. And all three of us are going to do that in order, and that's the game. And then we just keep going and doing that over and over until someone wins or loses, or someone wins or the game ends, okay? So now let's talk about that in more detail. So let's say it's France and Bavaria's turn. The, number, the first thing they do is they draw tactical cards. Everything in this game is revolved around these cards. This is a CDG war game. CDG standing for, sorry about that. Uh, CDG standing for card driven game. And so every single thing that happens in this game uses this finite resource of cards. Cards are gonna drive the politics phase, which we'll talk about. They're going to drive combat and they're going to drive resupplying your enemy troops at the end of a year once we get uh, into the winter phase, okay? So if we look at the beginning of the France and Bavaria's player's turn, they're gonna draw tactical cards, which I will say I've done for us here. We have France's hand and Bavaria's hand. And then they are going to check supply, okay? So we drew tactical cards, that was number one. Now we're going to check number two, which is which is supply. Every single turn you have to check to make sure all your generals are being supplied by their supply trains or by their home country. So what does that mean? So if you can see, this board uh, is populated with a bunch of discs and cubes. Those are the wooden components of the game, okay? The discs are generals, okay, which are basically your armed forces. And the cubes are the supply trains, supplying them with food, munitions, all that kind of stuff necessary for them thematically to sustain in, uh, you know, a wartime environment, okay? As long as a general is inside of their home country. So you can see this Austrian player is inside of his home country. He is considered to be in supply. Um, likewise, you can see this French player, these French players here are inside of their home country. They are in supply. However, once a general ventures outside of their home country, 
they now have to trace supply to this supply train. And that's what we're doing in phase two. Every general on that turn has to check supply. And that's basically just a very abstract way of saying you need to make sure that this cu this cube of yours is within a certain number of spaces of every general, okay? That is outside of your home country. So if we look at this French general right here, he is, as you can see, outside of his home country. So we evaluate every French general on this turn. This guy is inside of his home country. He's in supply. He's fine. This guy is also inside of his own country. He's in supply. He's fine. This French general is not inside of France, <clears throat> but he is within six spaces of his red cube, which is the supply train. So he's in supply. So you have to be within six spaces of your... Um, of your general, if you're outside of your home country, of a supply train, which you cannot trace through enemies, okay, which I'll explain in a second, to be considered in supply. So let's look at this guy. This guy is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine spaces away. Can I get there another way? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. He is out of supply. Bad news for this guy. If you ever, during this step, <clears throat> this supply step, if you check to see uh, if you're in supply and one of your generals is not in supply, it's bad, okay? He has to flip over on the board, and now he has to lose an army. Every general that you have on the board at the beginning of the game is going to have a certain number of armies attached to him. Uh, you can see French, uh, French, France has five armies, or five generals, which are represented by these discs. You can see this is general number one, Moritz, and he's right here. He starts the game with seven armies, okay? This number guy, number five, that we just checked for supply, is out of supply. He has to flip over. Uh, no Isles, he will now lose an army, and he's down to three. And armies are going to count for strength in battle. So that's bad. The worst thing, though, <clears throat> when you're out of supply, is you can no longer capture fortresses. And remember, we talked about this very briefly, but capturing fortresses is moving over an enemy fortress to get your victory point pool out. Now that he's out of supply, he cannot do that. So it is incredibly important for you to keep your supply train close enough to all of your generals that are not contained within your home country so they can stay flipped up, <clears throat> capture fortresses, and retain their uh, numbers in battle. All right, so that's all checking supply does. France and Bavaria would do that right now. Let's say this is the situation. Everyone's in supply. Everyone's happy. It's that simple. It takes two seconds. So now we move on to the movement phase. This is one of the probably the lengthiest parts of every player's turn is moving. When you move, you move every wooden piece on the board that you want to that's contained within your country. <clears throat> okay, so France controls France and Bavaria. So at the same time, they get to move all of their pieces. What I mean by the same time is they don't have to move General 1 before they move General 4 and 5, right? You can do these in any order you want to. So how movement works is you're going to move uh, your generals and your supply trains along the board to try to establish these um, victory point markers by conquering fortresses. So what that means is, let's uh, let's look over here. Let's say it's Prussia's turn, okay? I know we're doing France and Bavaria, but let's say it's Prussia's turn, all right? Prussia gets to move all of their generals and all of their supply trains um, by the following ways. If you're moving a general, um, you can see, before I talk about movement, you can see this board is just a mishmash of all these different circles, squares, uh, bold lines and non-bolded lines, okay? All the, all the spots on the map, everything, is a city, all right? These little circles are all cities. They're connected by roads. This is how you move. You move one road at a time to a city, stop, and then move again until you get to where you want to go, okay? Um, these bolded lines are main roads, and that'll count for us in a, in a second for something else. The circles are regular cities. The square ones and the star ones are fortresses. Minor fortress, major fortress. Don't worry about that. Just consider these fortresses. Basically, the squares and the stars are opportunities for the other players to gain victory points, okay? So it's Prussia's turn. He's going to move his armies, his generals and his supply train. You can see this general is out of the Prussia home country, so he has to make sure that when he ends his movement, he's in supply from this guy, okay? He's currently in supply. One, two, three, four, five, six. He's in supply at the start of his turn, so he's fine. All right, so now he's going to move. A general can move three points of movement if they're anywhere on the board, okay? So he's here. He's going to move one, two, three. His movement ends, okay? 
he has just moved through an enemy an enemy fortress. This is the main way to get victory points on the board. This is the main thing you're trying to do in this game is move through enemy fortresses. That's what you're if you could just do that the whole game and win the game, you'd be very happy because that would be an easy victory for you. So this Prussian general is 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 positioned in the perfect way that he's going to go one, two, three. He takes a victory point marker of his own in his pool, places it on the board. That's one of the many he needs to win the game. That's awesome. Okay. He just moved three spaces. He's done. If you're moving and your entire movement is contained within a main road, which is the bolded line, you can move an additional point of movement. So you always get to move three, but if your entire movement is on a main road, so like one, two, three, four, he could do that. And that might be better for him because he's going to capture two fortresses this way. Okay. You can also do what's called force march. A force march is kind of like um, this moving four spaces. And it can only happen on a main road, but you cannot conquer fortresses or initiate a battle, which we haven't gotten to, using a force march. But a force march lets you move eight spaces. So let's consider this general who's on the board here. He's on a main road and he's not in the battle yet. He wants to come into the battle or he wants to get into the fray, right? But he's really far away. He can do what's called a force march to move eight up to eight spaces with this guy. So he could go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, eight and end right there, okay? You can't force march through enemy fortresses because it's not that simple. You can't you can't conquer fortresses that way and you can't initiate battles. So this general cannot force march because he's blocked by this fortress. If this general was here, he'd also be blocked by this general. Uh, but force march is a really good way uh, in situations like this, when you're far away from what's going on in your own home territory to get through. Your own fortresses don't block you um, and stuff like that, okay? So there's three ways to move. You can move a regular general, and he always moves three points of movement. If he's contained within a main road completely, he moves four. up. This is always up to. He can move up to four. And he can also force march if he wants to, moving up to eight as long as he's on a main road and kind of in his own territory. Okay, now your supply trains work exactly the same way, only one less. So where a general can move a basic movement of three, your supply train can move a basic movement of two. However, if your supply train is moving entirely in all of its movement on a main road, it can move an extra one. So three total instead of four for a general, right? Um, you can never force march a supply train. Supply trains can only move either two or three spaces and that's it. All right, so that's how movement works. Um, you can never move through another wooden piece, whether friendly or enemy, the exception being a supply train. But I can never move a general through another one of my own generals or my own supply trains. I'd have to move them out of the way first. You can move through an enemy supply train, and you want to, because if you do, you gobble it up, eat it, and it's off the board, which is great because then your enemies are going to not be in supply, likely, on their next turn. Um so it's very important that you guard your supply trains so your enemies cannot come in here, one, two, three, four, and eat them, okay? It's very important to do that. Um, and it's also important that you figure out where you're going to move before you move because you can't move through your own pieces. You can move through your own, um, no, you can't move through, you can move through your own fortresses, but you can't move through your own generals or supply trains. So you have to move everything out of the way to get you where you want to go. Okay. So that's basically movement. Now let's say for the sake of this example, that's the Prussian player's turn and they're going to move. Okay. They already drew their cards. They already checked supply. Now they're going to move. This guy's going to go one, two, three. All right. He moved through this fortress. He is going to place a victory point marker on it. The rules with capturing fortresses are you just got to move through it and you get a victory point. Now, the only thing is if my general is three spaces with is within three spaces of this. Let's say my general's here. Then this is not a victory point yet. It is a question mark. Because a general of his own home country will protect all fortresses three spaces away from himself. Um, so let's say this was the situation. And let's see. Let's say he started here. And so he moves away from the fortress. One, two, three. Okay. He puts a question mark token here. 
instead of just an outright victory point. And that doesn't make any sense, you might be wondering, but it will in just a second. The reason you put a question mark there is because he is currently three spaces away from this fortress guarding it. Now Prussia's turn ends. Let's say Prussia moved all their guys. Oops, Prussia moved everybody they wanted to. Um, one, two, three. This one is not within three spaces, so this one is gone and becomes Prussian. Um, this goes back to Austria. And so now let's say the Prussian player has ended their movement. And now we do the next step, which is combat, number four. Any generals on the map that end their movement one space from another general is going to fight. And this fighting is the first way that you're going to see that we use these cards, okay? You can also see, if you look at the board here, that the board is is a grid of basically the four suits, right? You got, di you got diamonds, hearts, clubs, spades, and it's all over the board. Wherever each general is next to each other, whatever zone they're in, that's the cards they're going to play to the battle. So this right here, both players are going to be playing hearts cards. But if the Prussian player was here, they're still one connected space away, but now Prussia is playing diamonds. And that's very important for how you're going to position your battles because you have cards. This is the Prussian player's hand right here. They have these cards in their hand. We don't normally get to see this, right? This is just what they see. But they have three clubs, a heart, and two diamonds. So it might not be in their interest to fight in hearts because they only have this one heart. So maybe instead... When they moved, they decided to go one, two, three, and they moved back like one, one, two. Maybe they only moved one, two spaces because you can double back because they really want to try to get this fortress. So they moved into it and then back through it. Okay, and they ended their turn one space away. Now they're fighting in diamonds and I'm fighting in hearts. Okay. So they have a little bit of a better chance. So what happens next? In a combat situation is we evaluate the we first evaluate the strength of each leader okay so this guy is my number two i come down here and i check on this sheet which we are going to be writing on before the game starts to see how many armies we have um this is my number two general he starts with four armies okay this is uh the prussian players number three uh we see he also has four armies so the strength of the initial strength score is zero, zero, and it starts with the attacker. If it's tied, whoever's attacking, in this case, Prussia, plays the first card, and they have to play a diamond. So how it works is they choose one of these. Let's say Prussia plays this card. Boom. Now, Austria is in the hole five, and I have a decision to make as Austria. I can either accept the loss, and if I do that by not playing any cards, I would lose five armies because I'm in the hole five. I would get pushed back five spaces unless that wipes out my complete army, which it does. That would absolutely obliterate me off the map. All right. So that's what would happen if I accept the loss, which you can do. And it could be tactical to do that. But instead, I'm going to play one and one card only. So you see, I'm fighting in hearts. I'm kind of stacked here. So let's say I do this. I go up by one. Okay. So I play a heart. And instead of me being in the whole five, now I'm up one. Now it goes back to Ben, or <laughs> I call it Ben because Ben played Prussia last time. Now it goes back to the Prussian player who has another choice to make. They can play another diamond card or they can stop. Now here's why they might want to play and here's why they might want to stop. They want to play because they need to win to push Austria th more than three spaces away so they can successfully capture this fortress. That's the whole reason they're trying to fight right now because Austria is within three spaces of this fortress and he's guarding it. So Prussia is trying to fight Austria because the number of um, points that of strength that the battle is determined by, the difference there is how many spaces you get pushed away. So Prussia really wants this to be a victory point. So they're like, shit, OK, I need to play another card. So they play this diamond. Boom. Now, all of a sudden, they were down one. Now they're up eight. And so me as Austria is like crap. I have another battle coming up, let's say, where I'm fighting in hearts. And I'm like, ah, I, I, got a, I got a battle over here in a minute. You know, I need to save some of my cards. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to play this seven. So I'm down eight. I play the seven. Now I'm only down one. 
and you play one card at a time in combat. So it's it's the onus is still on me. I'm down by one. I have to play another card. You can't play all your cards at once and be like, I'm up 25. You can't do that. You have to play one card at a time. So I've just played a card. I am now down by one. And it's, at this moment, I make it a tactical decision. And I say, you know what? I accept the loss. I'm going to accept the loss. And you win. So what happens? So the battle ends. These cards are discarded. Um, the Prussian player is victorious. I have to lose one. I lost by one. So my number two army loses one army. Number two general loses one army. And now the Prussian player pushes me back one space. The cool thing about this for the losing player, he can only push me back one space. So he's either pushing me here or here. As you can see, both of those spots are still three spots away from this fortress. One, two, three. If you push me here, it's one, two, three. So either way, I lost the battle, but he does not get the victory point. And so that was kind of a win for me. Plus, I saved a couple more hearts cards over here for this battle I'm going to be fighting in in a minute with France. So hopefully that made sense. That's how battles work. So you just you just um, evaluate every single battle. If if um, oh, another thing that this did, I should say is only losing by one. You get a battle victory point, which is a victory point on the board, if you win a battle by three or more. And the player that loses by three or more loses a victory point. So let's say instead of Prussia winning by one, they won by three. They would have pushed me away two more, right? This would have fallen and been a Prussian city because now I'm more than three spaces away. They also would have gotten a victory point over here. And if I had one over here, I would have lost it. So battles can be huge swings of points each time. So it's very tactical to know when to take a loss when you're fighting. Hopefully that made sense. Um, so that's the way combat works. You just evaluate every combat like that. And then after that, after all the combat's done, then we go to the next player's turn. It's now Prussia and Saxony's turn. Well, okay, I just did Prussia and Saxony. Now it's Austria and the Pragmatic Army's turn. And now Austria is back on the offensive. Maybe I want to go back in here, fight you back, get you out of here, and then I can take this back over. Um, Pragmatic Army's coming over here, and they're going to try to fight France. Maybe I'm going to fight France over on this front. And it's just all-out craziness, and there's a lot of tense negotiation that has to happen because all three players are co both cooperating on one hand and against each other on the other hand, but we're also all separate, right? Um, Prussia and France are allies to Austria on this map, but they're still not teammates. You know what I mean? They're not, they're working together in a common goal to beat back Austria, but they still don't want the other one to do too much good. So there can there, there becomes this certain situation where even though these two are allies, eventually if one power like France starts getting all their victory point markers out, now Prussia starts to ally with Austria a little bit, work together to try to beat back France. Even though Prussia can't directly attack France, they can get in their way. They can do certain things. They can create peaceful situations with Austria. Different things can happen, and it's really, really interesting. Same with this Flanders map over here. Um, the Prussian player also controls the Pragmatic Army, who is just trying to destroy France over here to get their own victory point markers out. They don't care about... They're friends with Austria. So Austria is working together with the, the Pragmatic Army against France on this map, and France and Prussia are kind of working together to get rid of Austria on this map. So it's this really balanced way that the whole game kind of works together. So that's the entire game, except for the politics phase, which I'll talk about now. Um, so how the politics phase works is it's the very first thing that happens every turn. Now that you know uh, about the powers of the game and how those work, there is this board over here. Let me, at the beginning of every round, so potentially 12 rounds of the game, we're going to draw two cards from this politics deck. I'm going to bring them over here so you can see. Um, let me do this and flip. Two cards get revealed. And we are going to basically use cards again, and this is the very first thing that happens in the game every round, to see who's going to win, potentially win, these politics cards to mess with these tracks. And these tracks matter in the following ways. The first track is the Saxony track. Remember, Saxony starts the game allied with Prussia, and so Prussia gets to use these counters against Austria. However, if this tr as this track, you can see, this tracker starts here, and you can see green is Saxony, blue is Prussia. So this track is showing they are allied together. As soon as this track moves one to the right, Saxony becomes neutral. 
And now Prussia doesn't get to control them anymore. And if it moves so far to the right, now Austria is controlling Saxony. And so this is a very important track for the Prussian player and the Austrian player. They're vying for control of who controls Saxony, which is a big deal. The second track is the Russia track, which also um, impacts Prussia. You can see there's this disc with this uh, black X through it. At the beginning of the game, the Prussian player starts with one of their generals just completely off the board. That's six armies that Prussia just does not get to use. If this track ever goes to the left past this space, that army now becomes available for them to use on the board. So it's very much in Prussia's interest to move this track to the left and probably in Austria's interest to keep it to the right. That's the Russia track. The last track is the Italy track, and this concerns France and Austria. It starts here in the middle, and it's just going to be a tug of war. If it gets too far to the left, uh, France starts to gain victory points. If it gets too far to the right, Austria gains victory points and loses, and France loses pieces. If it gets this way, Austria or France gains victory points and um and Austria loses pieces. So France and Austria are vying for control of this track. So these, these three tracks are very, very important. And so at the beginning of every round, we have a politics phase to manipulate these tracks. Here's the way a card looks. You can see it's got the, 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 the major powers up top. You can see Prussia in blue, France in red, Austria in white. Those are the three powers that can interact with this card. Okay, and then those tracks on the bottom of the card are what's going to happen if a power wins. So let's say, um, let's say that this card is won by the Prussian player. Prussia can do everything on this card or nothing. So Prussia wins this card, and I'll explain how it happens in a second. They can move the Saxony marker to the left, which they desperately want to, because now it's going to be it's going to take longer to get them not to be neutral, right? And if they want, they can move the Italy marker to the right. But they might not want to do that because that kind of helps Austria. So they don't have to. They could just say, I'm going to move the Saxony marker to the left, and I'm not going to move the Italy marker at all. Or they could just say, I'm not going to move this card at all. It's gone. I just want it out of here. Right? Um, so that's really interesting. Now, the way to win these cards is you have to play a card from your hand. The card suit that you play is determined by the last player who won a victory. Or in the case of the very first turn of the game, when there's been no battles, we just draw a random card as Trump. So let's do that now. Uh, so boom, spades are played. Every player that wants to control one of these cards plays a spade card from their hand secretly um, if they want. And after that happens, they all get revealed simultaneously. And whoever has the highest card, in this case, Austria, gets to pick first. So I get to pick one of these two cards to play as Austria. And this is a big deal. I might pick this one because this one, I can just remove it from the game. So this top track doesn't move to the left, which I want. And I get to move the Italy track closer to the right, which gives me a victory point. And that's huge for me. So that is then discarded. And then now the Prussian player has the next highest score. They get to do this card. And they do. They'll take this and they'll move this to the left. And they'll move this to the left. And then that ends the politics phase. And so that's the way you manipulate these tracks. And then after the politics phase is over, we just go through and everybody takes their turns. And that's how the game is played. There is a lot more that's going on that I haven't talked about. There's like this uh, electoral election that happens um, that you can gain a victory point with. Uh, that I can easily explain during the game. You don't have to know about that. But basically what you need to know is you're basically drawing cards, moving your generals, staying in supply, trying to capture fortresses and win these combat situations to empty your victory point pool out of victory points to win the game. And there is a ton of negotiating and table talking and planning and thinking and positioning and jockeying to get yourself in the best position to um, win the game. Again, there's more I'll explain as it goes on, but I think this is going to be enough to get you started. Hopefully this wasn't a terribly long rules explanation. Hopefully you don't have a ton of questions. If you do, I will answer all of them, and um, I can't wait to play with you. So hopefully that happens soon, and I'll talk to you later.